Welcome to Saving Castles, the podcast for castle and chateau enthusiasts. Join us as we explore the fascinating history, stories and culture of these awe-inspiring structures from the legends and folklore to the latest in restoration. We'll cover it all, so whether you're a seasoned castle aficionado or just discovering the magic of these magnificent buildings, this is the podcast for you. So grab your headphones and let's dive in. The dawn of the 12th century found the world in the throes of the Second Crusade, a holy war waged on many fronts and pervading the socio-political landscape of the age. The epicentre of the conflict was the ancient and revered city of Jerusalem, coveted by Christian and Muslim forces alike. It was a time of great upheaval, of clashing swords and clashing faiths. Amidst this tempestuous period, in the year 1161, A king was born, one who would later be known as Baldwin IV. His birth was heralded with joy, yet simultaneously shrouded with impending dread. Little did anyone know that this child, born amidst turbulent times, would grow to be an emblem of courage and resilience. Baldwin was born to parents of royal lineage, Amalric of Jerusalem the king and Agnes of Courtenay his queen. Born amidst the power and grandeur of the royal court, the young Baldwin was destined to ascend the throne, but not even the wisest soothsayers could have predicted the challenges that lay ahead. Nevertheless, his destiny was sealed from the moment he drew his first breath. His name, bestowed upon him, was a statement of regal ambition. Baldwin, the bold friend carrying forth the legacy of his forefathers. The kingdom of Jerusalem was a realm of grandeur its borders marked by enemies and allies alike. The Latin kingdom, founded in the wake of the First Crusade, was an island of Christianity in the heart of the Muslim world. It was a beacon for pilgrims, a jewel desired by emperors, sultans and popes. The city's streets echoed with chants in a myriad of languages, the markets brimmed with goods from the east and the west, and the city's walls had borne witness to countless battles and sieges. But now, under the rule of King Amalric, the kingdom was enjoying a brief period of peace and relative prosperity. However, the surrounding storm was a constant reminder of the precarious position Jerusalem held. To the east, the formidable Muslim forces under the leadership of the charismatic and shrewd commander Nur ad-Din were consolidating their strength. Meanwhile, the Byzantine Empire, a once mighty Christian ally, was in decline, torn apart by internal strife and external threats. Amidst these geopolitical quakes, the Kingdom of Jerusalem stood a bulwark of Christendom in the east, its fate resting on the young shoulders of the future King Baldwin IV. In the year 1163, barely two years old, Baldwin was crowned co-king with his father. His world was a whirlwind of gilded pomp and ceremony, with the silent undercurrent of the immense responsibility that lay ahead. However, in the innocence of his childhood, Baldwin knew little of the burden of the crown or the intricate dance of diplomacy and warfare he was to engage in the future. For now, the boy king played in the royal gardens under the watchful eyes of his nurses, blissfully unaware of the destiny that was to befall him. He listened to the minstrels singing tales of brave knights and holy wars, oblivious to the fact that he, too, would soon be a key player in this grand historical narrative. His was a world of silken robes, sword fights with wooden sticks, and stories of valour and chivalry. But beneath this veneer of childhood innocence, the harsh realities of life were slowly creeping in. For Baldwin, life was not just a series of kingly duties waiting in the wings, but a more personal battle was about to unfold. A battle not with swords and knights, but with his own body. A condition that would mark him, challenge him, yet also define him in the years to come. Little did Baldwin or anyone else realise that he would become one of the most memorable kings in history, known not for his wealth or conquests, but for his indomitable spirit in the face of adversity. For the boy king was destined to become Baldwin IV, the leper king of Jerusalem. This chapter, The Dawn of a King, sets the stage for the rest of our narrative. 
We will journey with Baldwin through his life, exploring the remarkable reign of a king who stood steadfast in the face of both external enemies and internal demons, embodying virtues that were truly knightly. The world of Baldwin the Fourth was marked not just by the glinting crowns of kings and the clashing of armies, but also by the hidden spectre of disease. Unseen, unfelt at first, it would gradually become a relentless force that would shape and define his life. It was during his early childhood, around the age of nine, that Baldwin started to show signs of a grave affliction, a disease that was both physical and profoundly symbolic in its manifestation. Leprosy. In the Middle Ages, leprosy was a term that encompassed several skin-related diseases, not merely the one that we associate with the term today, also known as Hansen's disease. Leprosy, in its medieval context, was a potent signifier of decay and death, imbued with religious and moral connotations that extended far beyond the physical realm. It was seen as a punishment from God, a mark of sin, a living death. This was the dread disease that was slowly revealing its presence in the young prince's life. The first signs were subtle, easy to dismiss as childhood ailments. A persistent numbness in the limbs, a certain weakness, discomfort in the sunlight. But as time passed, these symptoms became impossible to ignore. The court physicians, skilled in the art of medieval medicine, recognized the symptoms for what they were. The diagnosis was spoken in hushed whispers, a terrifying word that echoed through the grand corridors of the palace. To understand the gravity of this diagnosis, we need to delve into the societal and cultural implications of leprosy in the medieval world. Lepers were outcasts separated from society due to the highly contagious nature of the disease and the fear and revulsion it inspired. They were required to wear distinctive clothing, ring bells to announce their presence and live in isolation, often in leprosaria or leper hospitals. Their very existence was a stark reminder of the fragility of life, the transience of beauty and the divine punishment for sin. It was within this chilling context that the young Baldwin received his diagnosis. A future king marked by a disease that traditionally warranted exclusion and ostracization. However, Baldwin's royal status and the absence of alternatives for the throne allowed him to evade the usual fate of a leper. Yet the irony was not lost on his contemporaries, and certainly it would not have been lost on Baldwin himself as he grew older. The young prince, guest into rule, was marked by the disease of the outcast, the marginalized, the condemned. As the disease began to manifest more intensely, Baldwin's life took a dramatic turn. His training in chivalry and knighthood, the traditional education of a future king, was overshadowed by his disease. The physical rigors of a knightly life became increasingly challenging as his condition deteriorated. He could no longer participate in activities that his peers took for granted. Riding, jousting, even holding a sword, everyday tasks for a knight became daily battles for Baldwin. Yet Baldwin faced his condition with a bravery that belied his tender age. Despite his physical limitations, he refused to let the disease define him. He continued his training, pushing his body to its limits, embodying the spirit of the knights he admired. He proved that even a leper could wield a sword, ride a horse, and command respect. In this way, Baldwin became a symbol of perseverance, a beacon of hope in a world rife with uncertainty and conflict. Even as his body succumbed to the ravages of leprosy, his spirit remained undaunted. His was a struggle not just against a physical malady, but against the societal perceptions and religious implications that came with it. The shadow of leprosy would loom large over Baldwin's life, a constant reminder of his mortality and the precarious nature of his reign. Yet it was within this shadow that he found the strength to rule, to fight, and to inspire. This was the birth of Baldwin IV, the leper king, whose courage and resilience would shape the destiny of the kingdom of Jerusalem and carve an indelible mark in the annals of history. Amidst the backdrop of the crusader kingdom of Jerusalem, 
under the cloud of the looming spectre of his disease, the young Baldwin's education began. Like a master blacksmith who tempers steel, Baldwin was being shaped and moulded, his character forged in the crucible of kingly virtues and knightly honour. The master blacksmith in this metaphor was none other than William of Tyre, Baldwin's tutor, a man of immense wisdom, deep piety, and broad learning. William was a clergyman, a historian, a diplomat, and an educator. Born in Jerusalem to a French family of the middle nobility, he had received an excellent education in France and Italy. He was deeply versed in law and the liberal arts, fluent in Latin, Greek, and Arabic. He was the epitome of the medieval scholar, his knowledge extending to many fields, from theology to history, from law to philosophy. William brought this vast wealth of knowledge and experience to his role as Baldwin's tutor. Under William's tutelage, Baldwin was introduced to the world of letters and numbers, the languages of Latin, Greek, and Arabic, the tenets of Christianity and the intricacies of law and governance. Yet these academic pursuits were just one facet of his education. For a future king, especially in a volatile realm like Jerusalem, learning to rule, to strategize, to lead in battle, were equally important, if not more so. To this end, Baldwin was taught the principles of chivalry. Chivalry, or the code of conduct for knights, was not just about martial skills. It encompassed a range of social, moral, and religious duties that guided a knight's behavior on and off the battlefield. Courage in battle, loyalty to the king and the church, protection of the weak and innocent, respect for the enemy, truthfulness, generosity, these were the core tenets of chivalry. These principles were imparted to Baldwin not just through instruction, but also through stories and examples. He heard tales of heroic knights and their noble deeds, of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, of Charlemagne and his Twelve Peers. These narratives fired his imagination, filling him with a deep yearning to emulate the virtues and valour of these legendary figures. However, Baldwin was not just a passive recipient of these lessons. He questioned, he analysed, he critiqued. He was not just learning to be a knight. He was learning to be a king, a leader. His vision for his kingdom was gradually taking shape, a vision that was as influenced by his personal convictions as by his education. This vision was marked by a keen understanding of the geopolitical situation of his kingdom, a sense of justice and fairness, and a determination to uphold the principles of chivalry, even in the face of adversity. His education under William had a profound influence on his character and his future reign, fostering qualities like wisdom, patience, courage and resilience, qualities that would stand him in good stead in the turbulent times ahead. Despite the debilitating nature of his disease, Baldwin's spirit remained undeterred. His dream of becoming a knight, a king, was not dimmed by the reality of his physical limitations. Instead, it seemed to burn brighter, fueled by his relentless determination and unwavering faith. As Baldwin grew older, his education became more complex and multifaceted. He was gradually introduced to the realities of governance, diplomacy and warfare, lessons that went beyond books and classrooms. Yet, through it all, he maintained his commitment to the ideals of chivalry and the principles he had learned from William. These would serve as his guiding lights, shaping his character, his rule, and ultimately his legacy. In this segment of Baldwin's life, we see the emergence of the future king, the leper king, who would defy the odds and rule with courage and wisdom. As the shimmering sun rose over the eastern horizon, the kingdom of Jerusalem braced itself for change. The streets, usually bustling with traders, travellers and troubadours, bore a sombre tone. For Amalric I, the king of this proud crusader state, had breathed his last. The throne was vacant. In the grand scheme of medieval monarchies, the passing of a king and the ascent of an heir were the natural rhythm of governance. But in Jerusalem, the situation was far from ordinary. The heir apparent was a teenager, a mere thirteen years old, and he was a leper. 
Baldwin's impending coronation sent ripples of unease through the intricate tapestry of Jerusalem's nobility. A kingdom already in a precarious state, balanced on the knife's edge of political and religious conflicts, was about to have a young, ailing ruler. The air was thick with anticipation, apprehension, and a myriad of whispered conspiracies. Some nobles believed Baldwin's health made him unsuitable for the throne, while others worried about the potential influence of regents and advisers who might seize control during his reign. Yet amidst these swirling clouds of controversy and speculation stood the figure of Baldwin himself, at once vulnerable in his youth and disease, but also resolute, a product of his rigorous education and inherent regality. It is essential to remember that Baldwin had been groomed for leadership from a young age. William of Tyre had not only imparted knowledge, but also instilled values and a sense of duty in him. He might have been young, but he was no stranger to the weight of responsibility. His mother, Agnes of Courtenay, played a pivotal role during this transitional period, often a controversial figure herself due to her earlier annulment from Amalric because of rumours of consanguinity. Agnes was nonetheless a source of support for her young son. She navigated the complexities of court politics, ensuring that Baldwin's coronation went off without a hitch. On the day of his coronation... The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was bathed in a golden glow, its ancient stones echoing with centuries of devotion. The clergy, nobility, and people gathered, their collective gaze fixed on the young prince, who was about to be anointed king. The atmosphere was a blend of reverence, anxiety, and hope. As the holy oils were applied to Baldwin's forehead, symbolizing his divine right to rule, there was no denying the weight of the moment. This was not just the crowning of a king, it was a significant statement. Jerusalem was entrusting its fate to a youth, a leper, signalling a profound act of faith and defiance. In the world outside, where lepers were marginalised and ostracised, Baldwin's coronation was an emphatic declaration that worth was not determined by physical health, but by character and divine ordination. The days and weeks following the coronation were tumultuous. Baldwin's rule was met with a mix of loyalty, scepticism, and outright opposition. There were whispers of rival factions plotting to dethrone the young king. The very pillars of the kingdom seemed to tremble under the weight of uncertainty. However, Baldwin, with wisdom and grace beyond his years, began his reign by surrounding himself with trusted advisers, including his tutor William of Tyre. By doing so, he exhibited a keen understanding of power dynamics, ensuring that he was neither isolated nor overly influenced. It was in these early days of his reign that the true character of Baldwin began to emerge. Against the backdrop of controversy, the boy king started to carve out a space for himself, laying the foundation for a reign that would be marked by valour, strategy and resilience Baldwin's unexpected rise to power was not just a testament to his personal strength, but also a reflection of Jerusalem's unique character, a realm where the unexpected was the norm, where faith and destiny intertwined in the most astonishing of ways. Baldwin's ascent to the throne was a beginning. The real tests of his kingship would come in the crucible of warfare and politics, Barely a year after his coronation, one such test came hurtling towards the young king, a test that would be etched in the annals of history as the Battle of Montgazar. In the year 1177, the renowned Muslim leader Salah ad-Din, better known as Saladin, entered the kingdom with an imposing force, allegedly to reinforce his recently captured Egyptian territory. The alarm bells began to ring in Jerusalem. The Crusader kingdom found itself standing at the precipice of a daunting conflict. Baldwin, despite his youth and inexperience, was quick to grasp the gravity of the situation. He knew he needed to rally his forces, not just to protect his realm, but to assert his authority as king. The outcome of this conflict would set the tone for his reign and profoundly impact the dynamics within his kingdom. The Crusader force was vastly outnumbered. Baldwin's troops consisted of approximately 500 knights and a few thousand foot soldiers. Saladin's forces were five times larger. The odds were stacked against the young king. 
yet with a firm resolve and a strategic mind honed by years of tutelage under William of Tyre, Baldwin embarked on a perilous mission to intercept Saladin's army. He marched his army to Ascalon, a strategic city along the Mediterranean coast. From there, he pushed forward towards Montgeisard, near modern-day Ramla, where Saladin's forces had camped. It was a daring move, an act of audacious bravery or perhaps reckless foolhardiness. But Baldwin had made his decision, steeled by the knightly virtues of courage and loyalty to his kingdom. As the armies clashed on that fateful day, the battlefield was a whirlwind of chaos and valour. Clanging swords, war cries, the smell of fear and determination hanging heavy in the air. It was a brutal dance of death and survival. Baldwin, clad in his armour, fought alongside his men, his physical ailment receding into the background amidst the throbbing pulse of battle. Despite being heavily outnumbered, the Crusader army displayed tremendous courage and tenacity. Baldwin's leadership was instrumental in bolstering their spirits. He was not just their king, he was their comrade fighting alongside them. The sight of the young, ailing king braving the battlefield became a beacon of inspiration for his troops, igniting a fervour that defied the odds. In a remarkable turn of events, Baldwin's forces won the battle. Saladin was forced to retreat, and the Crusader kingdom breathed a collective sigh of relief. The young leper king had stood his ground, had led his people to a glorious victory against a formidable adversary. The Battle of Monkizard was not just a military triumph, it was a personal victory for Baldwin, a resounding affirmation of his leadership. The reverberations of this victory echoed throughout the kingdom, even reaching the corridors of the sceptical nobility. There was a palpable shift in their perceptions of Baldwin. Doubts and whispers about his ability to rule began to recede, replaced by a grudging respect, even admiration, for his courage and strategic acumen. In the larger narrative of his life and reign, the Battle of Montgisard stands as a milestone, a crucial juncture that shaped his destiny and the course of his kingdom. It was a testament to his knightly virtues, his unyielding resolve, and his commitment to his people. It was an emphatic assertion that the King of Jerusalem, despite his leprosy, was a force to reckon with, a leader whose courage and wisdom defied his age and his physical condition. Baldwin, having tasted the intoxicating triumph at the Battle of Montgisard, now grappled with an even more complex battlefield, the realm of diplomacy. The Knight's Code of Conduct emphasized bravery and honor in battle, but Baldwin, as the King of Jerusalem, was not merely a knight. He had to maneuver the intricate and often treacherous paths of diplomacy to protect his kingdom and its interests. The stakes were high, and the challenges many. In the years following his victory at Montgeisard, Saladin rebuilt his forces, his sights unwaveringly focused on reclaiming Jerusalem. For Baldwin, the spectre of another conflict loomed ominously. His kingdom, while buoyed by the recent victory, was not in a position to withstand a prolonged conflict against a foe as formidable as Saladin. He needed to act, and he chose the path of negotiation. Baldwin's approach to diplomacy was an amalgamation of his knightly virtues and his understanding of real politic. He sought to balance the ideal of knightly honour with the pragmatic realities of governing a kingdom. His diplomatic ventures often involved maintaining a delicate equilibrium between various factions within his realm, regional Christian states, and the powerful Muslim kingdoms. He walked this tightrope with a dexterity that belied his youth and disease. The first step towards a peaceful coexistence was the Treaty of Ramla in 1179. Despite the recent victory, Baldwin extended the olive branch to Saladin. It was a move that demonstrated Baldwin's deep understanding of his kingdom's geopolitical realities. The treaty promised a three-year truce, a respite from the relentless cycle of conflicts. The negotiations were complex, fraught with tensions and delicate power plays, but Baldwin stood his ground firm in his commitment to secure peace for his realm. He recognized that true strength lay not just in wielding a sword on the battlefield, but also in crafting peace in the negotiation chamber. 
His demeanour during these negotiations echoed the quintessential knightly virtues of courage and honour, intertwined with the pragmatic realism of a seasoned statesman. One must remember that Baldwin's pursuit of peace did not mean a compromise on his kingdom's sovereignty. While the treaty ensured a brief respite from conflicts, it did not signify submission. Baldwin remained vigilant, prepared to defend his realm at a moment's notice. His diplomatic endeavours were not a renunciation of the knightly path, but a redefinition of it, an assertion that true knighthood encompassed both the courage to fight and the wisdom to negotiate. Baldwin's diplomatic endeavours were not limited to interactions with Saladin. He also engaged with neighbouring Christian states, manoeuvring through alliances and rivalries, securing his kingdom's interests and often mediating conflicts. For instance, his intervention in the dispute between Bohemond III of Antioch and Raymond III of Tripoli demonstrated his nuanced understanding of regional dynamics and his capability to mediate high-stakes disputes. However, Baldwin's pursuit of diplomacy did not sit well with all his subjects. Many in the kingdom, particularly the military orders like the Templars, were uneasy about the treaty with Saladin. They saw it as a deviation from the zealous pursuit of Christian dominion over the Holy Land. Baldwin had to weather this internal storm, standing by his decisions, his vision for peace, despite opposition. Navigating through the complex maze of diplomacy, Baldwin demonstrated a facet of his kingship that transcended his knightly persona. He embodied the essence of a wise ruler who recognized that the path to lasting peace and stability was through dialogue and negotiation. The young leper king, armed with his knightly virtues and strategic acumen, stepped into the intricate dance of diplomacy leaving an indelible mark on the kingdom of Jerusalem and the broader crusader narrative. In the canvas of the kingdom of Jerusalem, the colours of Baldwin's reign were vibrant and complex. Yet, as the leper king's health continued to deteriorate, the looming question of succession cast a long, menacing shadow over the realm. This period was marked by an intricate chess game of politics and familial relations that would determine the fate of the crusader kingdom. Baldwin was acutely aware of his worsening health and the uncertainty it brought to his kingdom. As the reality of his ailment seeped in, he made a decision that would significantly impact the kingdom's future. He named his young sister Sibylla's son from her first marriage, Baldwin V, then a child of just five years as his successor. This move was not just a political decision. It was also a testament to the depth of his love and concern for his kingdom and people. His illness might have debilitated his body, but it had not weakened his commitment to his realm. However, this decision was not without its complications. Sibylla was married to a man named Guy of Lusignan, a figure of significant controversy within the kingdom. Guy was a newcomer, his roots in the West, and was widely viewed with scepticism by many nobles of Jerusalem. His reputation was marred by allegations of ruthlessness and a propensity for violence. Many in the kingdom, including Baldwin, harbored deep reservations about his suitability for the throne. To mitigate the potential risk of Guy's ascension, Baldwin crafted a delicate compromise. In his will, he stipulated that should young Baldwin V die before reaching the age of majority, the decision of succession would rest with the barons of the kingdom and the kings of Christian Europe. This was a significant deviation from the traditional line of succession, and it reflected Baldwin's deep-seated apprehensions about his potential reign. Despite this clear expression of his misgivings, Baldwin was eventually compelled to name him as regent, mainly due to the political pressure from factions within his court favouring Guy. It was a move that weighed heavily on the ailing king. Yet, ever the dutiful ruler, he put the stability of his realm above his personal reservations. However, the naming of Guy as regent led to a tense dynamic within the kingdom. The nobility was divided, the citizens uneasy, and the future uncertain. Baldwin, despite his failing health, strove to keep the tenuous peace. His knightly virtues of loyalty and commitment to his realm driving his actions. 
The tension reached a boiling point at the Battle of Cresson in 1187. Guy's reckless aggression led to a disastrous defeat against Saladin's forces, vindicating Baldwin's initial reservations. The battle was a grim precursor to the kingdom's eventual downfall at the Battle of Hattin, which occurred a year after Baldwin's death. Throughout this intricate dance of succession, Baldwin demonstrated his deep commitment to his kingdom. He was not merely a warrior king. He was a leader who understood the profound responsibilities of his crown. In the shadow of an uncertain future, Baldwin stood as a beacon of stability. His actions a testament to his unwavering dedication to his realm. The leper king with his body wasting away, mustered every ounce of his strength to secure his kingdom's future. His actions during this period of uncertain succession were a powerful testament to his enduring legacy. The tapestry of Baldwin's life was intricately woven with the threads of knightly courage, political acumen, and the ceaseless struggle against his debilitating disease. As the year 1184 approached, his health began its inevitable decline— the leprosy advancing with an unrelenting ferocity. Yet even in the face of overwhelming adversity, his spirit remained unbroken, his determination undiminished. His final years were marked by an escalating series of challenges. The escalating tensions over succession, the ever-present threat of Saladin's forces and the ceaseless progression of his disease, these were the battles that the leper king had to fight. His physical strength was waning, but his resolve to serve his kingdom remained steadfast. In these years, the kingdom stood on the precipice of uncertainty. Baldwin's failing health was a source of apprehension, the looming void of his leadership casting a shadow over Jerusalem. The rapid progression of his leprosy during this period led to devastating physical impairment. Baldwin was afflicted with blindness and extreme physical deterioration, impairments that would challenge even the most robust of spirits. Yet he met these challenges with a quiet dignity and unwavering resilience. He bore the trials of his ailment with the grace of a seasoned knight, his spirit a shining beacon amid the encroaching darkness of his disease. Despite his physical afflictions, Baldwin continued to participate actively in the governance of his kingdom. He held court, met with his advisers, and even led his army into battle when needed. His failing health did not diminish his resolve to fulfill his duties as king. However, Baldwin's time was drawing to an end. On March 16, 1185, the leper king breathed his last. His death marked the end of an era, an era defined by his indomitable spirit, his wise leadership, and his unwavering commitment to his kingdom. The kingdom of Jerusalem had lost a beloved king, steadfast leader, and a gallant knight. As news of his death spread through the kingdom, it was met with profound sorrow. The people mourned the loss of a king who had led them through tumultuous times with grace and courage. He was a king who, despite being afflicted by a devastating disease, had defied the odds and ruled with a wisdom that belied his young age. Baldwin's legacy was a complex one. He was remembered as a knight who embodied the chivalric virtues of courage, honor, and loyalty, a wise ruler who led his kingdom with a deep understanding of the intricate dynamics of power and diplomacy, and a leper who bore his affliction with dignity and resilience. His death marked the end of his personal battle with leprosy. However, his passing also left a void in the leadership of the kingdom of Jerusalem, a void that would ultimately prove disastrous in the face of Saladin's relentless campaign to reclaim the Holy Land. Even in death, Baldwin IV of Jerusalem left an indelible mark on the annals of history. His life was a testament to the dedication of a king and the resilience of a man living with a debilitating disease. The death of Baldwin IV marked the end of an era leaving a vacuum of leadership that would ultimately lead to the fall of Jerusalem. The figure who stepped into this vacuum was the controversial Guy of Lusignan, a man whose reign would be marred by military blunders and a disregard for the wisdom of his predecessors. The destiny of the kingdom of Jerusalem was now entwined with his volatile rule. Soon after Baldwin's death, 
The preordained successor, young Baldwin V, died prematurely in 1186, leaving his mother, Sibylla, as the claimant to the throne. Despite Baldwin the Fourth's carefully crafted plans for succession, Sibylla's ascendancy allowed Guy to claim the throne, and he was crowned King of Jerusalem. This ascension, however, was far from universally accepted. Many barons of Jerusalem remembered Baldwin's reservations about Guy and found him an unworthy successor to the throne. His contentious reign, coupled with the loss of the beloved leper king, created a kingdom teetering on the precipice of chaos. Upon assuming power, Guy of Lusignan was thrust into the heart of the Crusader-Saracen conflict. Saladin, the formidable Muslim leader, was amassing his forces, his eyes set firmly on Jerusalem. However, instead of adopting Baldwin's adept strategy of political manoeuvring and timely military intervention, Guy's approach was driven by rash decisions and misplaced aggression. One of the defining moments of his reign was the disastrous Battle of Hattin in July 1187, a crucial turning point that led to the downfall of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Guy led the Crusader army into a perilous march across a waterless plateau, falling into Saladin's trap. The ensuing defeat resulted in a catastrophic loss. The Crusader army decimated and the true cross-captured by Saladin's forces. The defeat at Hattin left Jerusalem defenseless. Its once formidable army reduced to a shadow of its former self. With Guy captured, the morale of the kingdom was at an all-time low, its future uncertain. Saladin, seizing the opportunity, laid siege to the Holy City. After a few short months in September 1187, Jerusalem, the crown jewel of the Crusader states, fell to Saladin's forces. This defeat marked a stark contrast to the time of Baldwin. The leper king had managed to keep Saladin at bay despite his illness and political pressures. Yet within two years of his death, his kingdom fell into the hands of the enemy. This turn of events underscored the effectiveness of Baldwin's rule and the stark shortcomings of Guy's leadership. In the aftermath of Jerusalem's fall, the Kingdom of Jerusalem was reduced to a strip of land along the Mediterranean coast, a sad remnant of its former glory. Guy was eventually released by Saladin only to find his kingdom in ruins and his authority greatly diminished. The fall of Jerusalem were defining moments in the history of the Crusader states. They marked a shift from the astute leadership of Baldwin IV, a change that had dire consequences for the kingdom. The loss of Jerusalem was a devastating blow to the Crusader states, a testament to the profound impact of leadership on the fate of a kingdom. The downfall of the Kingdom of Jerusalem under Guy's rule brings into sharper focus Baldwin's tenacity and diplomatic finesse. Despite battling a debilitating disease, Baldwin had managed to keep his kingdom intact. His life and reign stand in stark contrast to the failure of Guy's rule, serving as a testament to the knightly virtues of wisdom, courage, and dedication. As we conclude this historical narrative, we reflect on the life of Baldwin IV, the leper king of Jerusalem, whose remarkable story intertwines courage, wisdom, fortitude, and adversity into an enduring legacy. Baldwin IV's reign is a poignant reminder of the indomitable human spirit and its capacity to transcend the boundaries set by disease and adversity. His keen understanding of the dynamics of power, coupled with his courage, enabled him to defend his kingdom against the formidable Saladin. His rule witnessed victories against the odds, such as the remarkable Battle of Mont Kaiser, where he led a much smaller force to a momentous victory over Saladin's armies. Baldwin's leadership style was characterized by a fine balance of military might and diplomatic tact. His reign saw the establishment of complex alliances and diplomatic efforts that aimed to unite a realm often fraught with internal strife. His understanding of the delicate balance of power in the region was instrumental in keeping the Muslim forces at bay for the duration of his rule. In contrast, the reign of his successor, Guy of Lusignan, underscores the significance of Baldwin's prudent leadership.
His successor's lack of diplomatic skill and military foresight resulted in the catastrophic defeat at Hattin and the loss of Jerusalem, illustrating the crucial role Baldwin played in maintaining the stability and integrity of his kingdom. However, Baldwin's legacy transcends his political and military accomplishments. He became an emblem of resilience and endurance, a figure of hope for those who suffered. His tale is a compelling reminder that physical ailments do not define one's worth or potential. His spirit, unbroken by the debilitating effects of his disease, continues to inspire. Baldwin IV was more than a king. He was a true knight. His story remains an integral part of the rich tapestry of medieval history, an enduring narrative that continues to resonate. Yet, the fall of the kingdom of Jerusalem in the aftermath of his death reminds us that Baldwin's reign was an exception, a period of relative stability in a region defined by turbulence and conflict. It illuminates the importance of strong and wise leadership and the impact it can have on the fate of a kingdom. Baldwin was such a leader, his reign a testament to the knightly virtues he so valiantly embodied. The life and reign of Baldwin present an indelible image of a king who defied the odds, who ruled with wisdom and courage, and who bore his debilitating disease with grace and resilience. His story is a stark reminder of the power of the human spirit to endure and thrive, even in the face of the harshest adversity. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Saving Castles podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode, where we'll continue to explore the fascinating world of castles and chateaus. Don't miss out and subscribe to our podcast to get notified when new episodes are released. For more information about us and our work, visit savingcastles.com. Thank you for listening. 